What's your name? OCO. Oh, I got you. Okay, yes, yep. But let me put you in. I will put you in. Hold up. Yep, yep. Okay, good. Yay, we're all here. Yay. All right, now that we're all here, I got bad news. No, I'm just kidding. Okay. What? I'm just kidding. I've got good news and bad news. The good news is there are free donuts. The bad news is the world's ending in three hours. Uh, so descriptive ethics. So can anybody tell me what they think descriptive ethics um, are? What What do you think? I feel like it would be like, it's not like, I feel like it would be like the virtues where you use ethics to maybe describe a culture or a person. Mm -hmm. Just something where you... you no, well, use the what? What was it again? Use the... I can't remember what the exact term mm -hmm. is, but the virtues that like wisdom and dependence of Oh, okay. <laughs> so describing or, or defining or uh, uh, sort of uh, focusing on the virtues that people use, right? Yeah, Within, using that like... To, to guide and to uh, help them sort of navigate their way ethically, right? Yeah. The situation. Okay, fine. That, I like that. That's Anybody, anybody else gonna, want to take a stab at it? <laughs> I mean, even though we were talking about horror movies, no pun intended about the stab thing. Um, yeah, it's the study of ethics using science. That's all it is. So we study ethics and we use science. So it's basically determining whether something is right or wrong, ethically, based on statistics. Like a majority of people think that X is wrong, right? So we're, we're using a scientific metric. We're using statistics, right, in that, in, with, in that regard. Or we're looking at it historically. Historically, people have always felt that um, stealing from people is wrong, or something like that. So it's just using the metric of science uh, to study ethics. And there's a variety of ways you could do that, a lot of ways we could do that. Um, you could probably even use like neuroscience. Like there's probably some area in the brain that might be related to ethics, and that might light up when someone's performing a particular task, and that might determine whether, uh, for that person at least, that that's uh, right or wrong. All right, so I, I, I'm going to probably use this for, uh, for this class, too. I usually use, use it for the ethics uh, course. But there's three basic questions <laughs> for, um, for ethical behavior. Okay, the first one is, am I doing the right thing? That's pretty basic, right? Am I doing the right thing? Am I, you know, uh, performing the right, you know, do, doing what I'm supposed to do, right? Does that make sense? Doing the right thing. But we always forget about these other two. Am I doing it the right way? So here's a good example. Let's say my friend George has a gravy stain on his shirt, right? He has a gravy stain. And uh, the, the right thing would be to do would be to tell him because I don't want him to be embarrassed, right? Because he's going to go out and other people are going to see it and they're going to laugh, chuckle, whatever. And I don't want to embarrass him. So what I'm going to do is, is tell him, you have a gravy stain. Now, there is a wrong way and there's a right way to do that. Now, the wrong way obviously would be, let's say there's a crowded room like here, and I'm like, hey, you've got a gravy stain. And I'm pointing it out to everyone, right? So I'm doing the right thing, I'm pointing it out. I'm doing it the wrong way, right? Because the way I'm doing it, it's ultimately going to bring shame, embarrassment, get whatever to, to him, and it's kind of defeating the purpose. So um, oftentimes people will say they're doing the right thing, like, what? I was just helping you. Have you ever heard somebody say that to you? And they're really just being a jerk, right? They're like, oh, I was just helping you out. I was just trying to be a nice guy. When really, they were just being an asshole. Right? So <laughs> oftentimes, you might do the right thing, but you might be doing it the wrong way. Does that make sense? Okay. And you might be doing it for the wrong reason. So let's say George has a stain on his shirt. I owe him like 10 bucks, and I want to get out of paying him the $10. So I try to get on his good side by you know, being nice to him. right? Well, that's not a really good motivation. I mean, we, we shouldn't do the right thing just because it's going to bring us some sort of, uh, you know, uh, some sort of monetary, you know, uh, value or it's going to help us or enrich us. It should be for other people, right, or for others, or for the whole community at large, not just for me. Because uh, ethics is a contractual, social phenomenon. It's not something that's just based on, um, you know, an individual's subjective feelings, right, it's based on what we all agree on. So uh, I shouldn't be doing it for the right reasons. Have you ever had somebody that tries to get on your good side just to get something out of you? You ever had some uh, boyfriend, girlfriend, right? 
I mean, right? I mean, everybody's been in a relationship. They always, they're always trying to get something out of it, right? Trying to, you know, trying to, you know, maybe. I, I've, I've seen, like, guys where they would date girls and they would just date them just so they could, like, because they were, like, freeloaders, never worked. And they would just, like, you know, get free food, get a ride. Oh, hey, baby, I need a ride to uh, the, I can't say. I was going to say the, the methadone clinic, because that's really bad. But you know what I mean? Somebody who's, like, just some piece of crap dude is just like, come on, baby. Come on, man. You know, but you have people that will use you, right? They're going to use you. So basically, in order to fulfill uh, or to be ethical or to act ethically, you do have to do the right thing, but you have to do it the right way. So you have to do it the right way, the appropriate way, not a way that's going to hurt someone. <laughs> or, or bring harm to them or enrich you as opposed to them. And you have to do it for the right reasons. You have to do it because it's the ethical thing to do, not because it's going to make you look better, right? And I'm sure you all know people that do that, right? You, you, or all of your friends and all of your relatives are like perfect, godlike deities, right? Is that, does anybody have anyone in their, in their life that they would say are really bad people or kind of bad or just annoying? No, you don't know. You, you don't know one single person that is uh, bad. I thought you were asking me. Oh, no, I was talking to her back then. But no, I mean like, because um, she was shaking her head no. But um, but that does make sense, because if, it, if it's someone who isn't a very good person, you're probably not going to associate with them. Right? So you're probably going to be like, no, I'm not going to associate with them. But basically, those are the three metrics, right? All right, so descriptive ethics, going back to that, um, it studies using empirical facts about ethical acts, beliefs, perspectives, and such. All right, <laughs> there are three branches of ethics. All right, so we got normative ethics. Normative, that's just a fancy word for what we see in nature. All right, that's what we observe. So normative ethics is basically what you observe, how people behave and act, and kind of more um, in nature. Metaethics is the ethics where you're studying ethical systems where you're evaluating them like I don't like virtue ethics. I don't and because of the XYZ. So it's the study of ethical systems. It's stepping outside of ethics and it's studying the various ethical uh, systems, practices. Maybe even somebody doesn't even have a system that they can identify, but a meta ethicistian or power meta ethicist will probably say, well this is the system that you're working with, that framework you're working and then you have applied ethics. That's the fun. And we'll be getting more into applied ethics probably mostly in this class, particularly in after the first couple of weeks after we don't all the theoretical stuff. And that's how do you do ethics, right? And these are specific questions, like in your field particularly. Like we talked about like, uh, like euthanasia and right to privacy and things like that. Uh, patient care. Those are applied ethics. So we want to. We want them all to work together. So we can't just do applied ethics, right? Because if we just did applied ethics, we wouldn't have any sort of system or any understanding of what we're doing. We all kind of create our own systems, even if we don't articulate them. We do have kind of an embedded ethics or ethical system that we abide by, right? I mean, everybody has kind of a code, right? Okay, this is, this is where our step, draw the line, you know. No one can do this. If they do this, I, I can't, you know, I can't abide by that. So we all have kind of lines in the sand, and we have reasons for that. And those reasons are related to the normative ethics and the meta-ethics. Uh, the normative ethics are observed ethical um, systems that we, that we sort of embrace. And then the meta-ethics is the analysis of those. And the analysis would be like, I don't like the way, I don't like the way that they treat people. Because let's say you got some dude, and he's treating people really bad. His ethical system is, oh, they should act like I do, or something. You know what I mean? That's his ethical system. And you're stepping outside of it and evaluating and go, that guy's a douchebag. I don't like the way he treats other people. He has a really bad ethical system. So that'd be meta ethics, because you're stepping outside the ethical system and, 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 and analyzing and um, evaluating other people's ethical uh, convictions. Does that make sense? So you got those three tiers, those three levels. All right. <clears throat> search for and just, okay, so normative ethics, search for and justification of ethical norms. So an ethical norm is, like I said, something you just see in, in, um, in nature. <laughs> um, Meta-ethics is the study of meaning of justification based on moral beliefs. That's, like I said, it's evaluating um, ethical systems, basically, and ethical beliefs. Like, I think everyone 
who uh, doesn't drink coffee should be stepped on their have their toes stepped on. I don't. I mean, that'd be a really weird ethical moral belief, but you know, something like that. And then applied ethics, obviously, is the use of moral norms and concepts to resolve practical moral issues. And like I said, that is uh, basically where we're uh, taking these ethical moral um, uh, systems and we're applying them. You know? And we're going to talk a lot about that, uh, the application of these moral and ethical systems. Mm. Anybody like iced coffee in here? Anybody? Pretty good, right? I, I just started like, like really getting into it recently. Because it's hard to find, like, dude, I'll go to like Speedway and have all this crap. And um, they, like, they'll have like, I always get the cappuccino, like the fake coffee, you know, the, the fake coffee you were talking about. And um, they always have like crappy choices, but at least these taste really good. I like the taste of these. All right. Okay, so let's go on to this. Did, did you, do you need some more time to run them down? Yeah. Okay, I'll leave, it right I'll, I'll leave it up there. I'll leave it up there. Yeah. Oh shoot! No. Okay. Um, there we go. There. All right. I'll leave it up there for a second. So, does anybody have any questions about these? They're pretty basic, and also too, all of these. I I I believe I posted. If I'm not mistaken, I believe I posted the lecture notes from last week. So I'm going to have the uh, lecture notes from this week as well on there. Or, I'm sorry, this day, um, you know, uh, week one, Wednesday. So I'm going to put these on there as well, so you guys will have them. Does that make sense? Cool. That way, and all this stuff's going to be on the test. And like I said, I'm going to have, uh, I'm going to have lecture notes that you can sort of refer back to, and do like the way the lecture notes are worded. It's gonna, it's like so easy. The qu their quizzes, quizzes are so easy. You'd have to literally have no pulse to, um, to, to pass them. Unless you're a vampire. I think vampires don't have pulses, right? But they're smart. Isn't that weird? They don't have a pulse, but they're smart. That's strange. I don't understand. Did you get it all? Okay. Um, uh, let's get this. All right. So now we're going to talk ethics and moral philosophy. Yay, we're getting more into the, um, uh, the nuts and bolts. Okay, ethical re relativism. Anybody want to anyone take a stab at what they think ethical relativism is? Relativism. Have you, has anyone ever heard the term relativism? Does that sound familiar to you? You kind of. What What do you What do you think it is? It's about your relatives. Like, well, I don't like my cousin, so that's my ethic. No, I'm just kidding. No. What, what do you What do you think it is? Um, I would say like the general overview of like, oh, like, like this group, this is mm -hmm. what the average ethical is. So it's 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 looking at ethical systems based on their groups, group or cultural identity, right? That's good. And which, which will be obviously diverse. It's gonna be different. Each, each uh, ethical group's gonna be um, different, right? All right, let's go. So it, ethics just starts with the assumption that moral norms are the same for everyone. Just, do you kind of agree with that? Do you think ethical norms should be the same for everyone? Ethical behavior? It gets kind of messy, doesn't it? Because some groups see certain values as being more important or less important, or even existent or non-existent than others. So ethics typically, and I mean, for the, for the sake of this course, we're going to assume that they're all the same for everyone. So we're going to do the basics. We're not going to get into uh, should you, uh, I don't know, um, wear a dress suit to a business meeting. You know, that, that's a very niche cultural expectation, right? That's not going to be an expectation in another culture. It might be slightly unethical in some weird way, but uh, that would be one of those areas where it's very relative, right? I mean, it, you know, in some cultures you might, have, you know, dress a completely different way, and if you wore a suit, you'd actually be disrespectful to everyone. But um, for the most part, the basic issues, like don't steal from people, don't murder people, right? I mean, the basics, right? Um, those are pretty much universal for everyone. So moral objectivism. <laughs> All right. Um, anyone want, want to take a stab at what that word means? Objectivism. Anybody know what objectivism is, or being objective as opposed to subjective? Like here's objectives. Anybody know the difference between the two, between objective or objectivity and subjectivity or subjective? 
Well, ethics starts with the assumptions of, okay, so we said that moral objectivism, objectivism suggests that moral value standards are objective. So basically, objectivity is just the idea that it's the same for everyone. It's outside of my brain. Subjective is just in here. Right? It's just me, coming from me, how I feel. Right? Um, can, can anyone feel the way you feel? Do you think that anyone can have the same exact, yeah, they can, right? I mean, you, your consciousness, your specific consciousness of your particular individuality cannot be experienced by anyone else. That's subjective. That's how, how things feel to you. There's no way anyone else can magically transport into your mind, spirit, whatever, whatever you want to call it, your neural connections or whatever, and uh, feel the things the way you do. But there are probably some objective sort of uh, areas that we all agree on. So objectivity is outside of that, and it's how things are that are agreed upon by everyone else. So moral objectivism suggests that moral value standards are objective. In other words, they're the same for everyone, as opposed to just for me, which would be like egoism. Egoism, um, I remember I had a professor who used to teach egoism, and it's just the view that moral, um, moral values are sub purely subjective. And the idea is to come up with ethical systems like a bubble to where that your ethical perspectives do not bump into anyone else. It's kind of an interesting sort of theory. That's called egoism. Um, I, we're not really going to go into discussing what egoism is, but it's kind of an interesting perspective, right? Where you're just like a bubble. And you have your own views. and doesn't matter what you believe, just as long as it's not hurting anyone else, right? And, uh, you know, I think there's some, uh, there's some truth to that. Okay, so moral absolutism. Ooh, that sounds very kind of arrogant, doesn't it? Absolutism. Now, absolutism is objective moral standards or values allow for no exceptions and must be applied the same in all cases. Right? So if you uh, steal a... Has anyone ever seen that movie, Les Miserables? You ever seen? Has anyone seen Les Miserables? Well, seen the, the uh, musical or, or, or the movie with uh, the dude that played uh, Wolverine? Yeah, he's awesome. No, um, has anyone seen that movie? Or do they know the story of Lehman's? Where it's like basically Jean Valjean, uh, yeah, Jean Valjean, he's this poor French dude, and he steals bread for his family, and he gets like a ridiculous amount of jail time. And he finally gets paroled, but he fails to meet one of his parole officers, and he's on the run. So it's the idea that no matter what, it doesn't matter how you know, what, what it is, it's always going to be the same, no matter, you know, for everyone. And so if you steal, it, basically stealing is always wrong. It doesn't matter if it's a piece of bread or if it's, um, you know, a, a ship or something. It doesn't matter, which is ridiculous. But abs moral absolutism basically states that if, if you have a law, everyone has to abide by that law regardless. And there are no exceptions, right? And there are some good things about that, but there's some bad things about that, too. And if you watch Les Miserables, you'll see some of the bad things about moral absolutism and how if somebody's just very um, fund fundamentalist about that, then you can fall into some major problems. Right? Now, ethical relativism. Now we'll talk about that. So, and it has nothing to do with your cousin. Um, so moral standards are not objective, but are relative to what individuals or cultures believe. So <laughs> what this means, and that goes to egoism. It doesn't matter what you believe, just as long as you're not bumping into anyone else. Um, and cultural relativism is the idea that you might have a culture. Let's say you have a culture that, um, I don't know. Uh, can you think of any cultures that perform, um, perform behaviors or actions that you feel are kind of wrong? Right? Um, if you could think of that, that would be it. Like if you had a culture that, and ate their neighbors or something. I mean, you know, for that culture, that's fine, you know. But in our culture, we might see that as wrong. Uh, ethical relativism would say, you know what, that's, that's their culture. We cannot, you know, evaluate their culture by any other objective standard. That's just what they have decided as a culture, as, as what, are va what, what uh, values are important and what values are not important. And we can't really say whether what they're saying is, or what they're uh, embracing is right or wrong. That kind of makes sense? So, um, here, have you guys ever heard of that one? There's a culture, there's this island off the coast of India. 
and it, it's completely isolated from the rest of the world. And the people that live there are very primitive natives. And anyone, there's been a couple people that have landed there, I think some missionaries and stuff, and they were just like immediately killed. I mean, they come on the beach, and these dudes are just pelting them with like spears. They just do not want none of us. Not, none of, you know, civilized culture, they don't want it, which I, mean, I guess if I lived there, I probably wouldn't want to be a part of the world either. <laughs> but, but I mean, but the point is, is that they have particular cultural values, and they don't want it to be interrupted by, or infected, right, by by uh, the East or the West, it doesn't matter, or, uh, civilized or modern culture or whatever. Has anyone ever heard of that island? You ever heard of that? You heard of that, right? Have you seen some of the videos that dudes like, they're like on a boat and they like come to the, on the beach and just dude, these dudes come out and they're just like, <laughs> just throw, they, they're done, man. It's just like, I have no, I would have no, you know, interest in going to that island because I mean, they clearly, they, I mean, they seem happy, right? They, they, they don't want to be, they want to be left alone. There's nothing wrong with that. It's like the dude that lives in his house and he says, no, tra have you ever seen those dudes with no trespassing and he's got mean dogs and it's like, if you step on the property, you're, you're going to get eaten alive by some big old Rottweiler or something. So some people just want to be left alone. So um, subjective relativism. So we have different types of relativism. Uh, subjective relativism. This is, a little, this is more individualistic. A form of ethical relativism where the moral standard is sanctioned by a person. It's kind of like what I was talking about with egoism. So uh, subjective relativism is the idea that each individual person has a set of values. And for them, that is what determines what's right and what's wrong. You know what I mean? So I, as a person, think that everyone on every Tuesday should eat tacos, right? Because that's the ethical standard. And if you don't, I'm going to... I'm not going to do anything about it, but in, internally I'm just going to think less of you because you're not eating tacos on Tuesday. Right? So for me, that's my ethical standard. Right? And you might have a different ethical standard. Like if you do eat tacos, tacos on Tuesday, you're a sellout, you're, you're just going along with the trends, and you're, you're abhorrent. So <laughs> a subjective relativism is sanctioned by each individual person. I mean, that's a bit extreme, but you know, I don't think you know, there's anyone that like shames other people for participating or not participating in Taco Tuesday. You guys, I guess, when you went to high school, right, they had Taco Tuesday, right? Every, right? It's so good. I just don't understand the whole, it, it's, it's goofy, man, Taco. It's funny. I don't know. I, I like tacos, but I don't like those sh shitty, I like good tacos, like where it's made with real, like real beef yeah. or real chicken, you know what I mean? Like, re like a street taco, man, like from freaking Texas or California, real, ugh, with lime and, not this garbage, they, you know, ground beef, you know, screw that. But anyways, um, of course, that's just, and that's my personal subjective relativism. That's what I, that's my personal. Now, now we have cultural relativism, which is a uh, form of ethical relativism where the moral standard is sanctioned by culture. So instead of it sanctioned by an individual, it's sanctioned by a particular culture. So if you have a culture, and that could be based on, it could be ethnic, it could be national, it could be group, right? And it could be like, you're in one of those, like, Stranger Things, weird high school groups, and uh, if, if people don't play D Dungeons and Dragons, they're you know they're a bunch of you know, I don't know whatever I don't whatever they think. So I mean, it's basically based on the culture, cultural standard. It's sanctioned by a particular culture, and you can't really say one culture is better than another. You just kind of look at the culture and go, that's that's their values. I can't really evaluate it. I can't really say it's right or wrong. That's just what they've determined as a culture to be what's right and wrong for them. All right, so um, anthropology and moral diversity. Yeah, what? Oh, I'm sorry, my bad, my bad. Okay, all right, let me get that. There we go. But yeah, it's basically uh, sanctioned by a culture. Like, have you guys have seen any cultures that you're like, I can't believe they do that? Have you ever, have you ever seen that, like a culture like that? Like, um, I don't know, like, uh, what's a good example? Um, like, certain states have state taxes, some don't, like a sales tax. Okay. I got it? Okay. All right. Good, you saved me, because I was going to rant on uh, sales taxes. No, I don't, I don't, I don't really care. All right, because some, some states do have uh, sales tax, some don't. You know, like, actually, like, we have a sales tax, but I used to live in Texas. They don't have a sales tax. 
So they get their taxes from other ways. So it's kind of interesting. But I know we don't. Like, does Ohio have a sales tax? I forget. They do, right? Yeah. I know Texas doesn't. <laughs> All right. Um, anthropology and moral diversity. All right. So um, a quote from Solomon Ash. We consider it wrong to take food from a hungry child, not if he is overeating. Um, this is evidence uh, that does not furnish. Basically, this is proving, or according to him, proving that, um, that there is a universality of ethics. In other words, cultural or subjective relativism is untenable or something that we cannot really uh, argue for. What he's saying is that there are universal ethical truths that run the gamut, that are just true for everyone, all cultures. So what he's arguing against is this idea, I mean, you might have, like I said, you might have these niche sort of areas where, you know, dress a certain way or, you know, whatever, but essentially, for the most part, we have a general universal set of principles that we all agree on. So, um, and that's anthropolo an anthropology and moral diversity. So from an anthropological perspective, which is the study of humans, right, and human cultures throughout history, going back to, I don't know, uh, late author, of, oh no, not Australopithecines, they were still, they weren't humans yet. I don't know, Homo erectus and Homo habilis. I don't know. I don't know, I don't know how far it goes back, but anyways, all humans, uh, they're not really technically human. Uh, I don't know what kind of ethics Australopithecines have, um, but I'm sure they had some. Okay, so problems with ethical relativism. So here's some problems. Uh, for one, it conflicts violently with common sense, uh, the realities of the moral life. So it con conflicts violently with common sense and the realities of moral life. And two, there can be no moral disagreement. Um, so what that means is <coughs> that uh, the moral life suggests that what's true for one person is true for everyone. You know, uh, what was it like? Martin Luther King Jr. said, uh, "If you see injustice here or anywhere, that's a that's uh, a crime against injustice everywhere." Right. So if you hear about injustice in a far distant country, and you you shouldn't just go, "Oh, that's just there." For, for people like Martin Luther King Jr. and other civil rights leaders and, and ethicists and, and, and leaders in general, that's an injustice everywhere. So that applies for everyone. And there could be more, no moral disagreement. In other words, well, if it's, it's true for that culture, but not true for our culture. Well, what does that mean? Right? So um, that is a problem. All right. All right. Is cultural realism more plausible? All right, so I tell you what, let's, I'll give you guys like five minutes. Let's go into groups and we'll discuss this. We'll see if you guys think uh, cultural uh, relativism is plausible. Cultural or even like subjective relativism. Like the idea that your values are your values. Right? And your values are your values. And they derive only from your perspective. And they have nothing to do with what's going on here. Right? That'd be subjective. Whereas cultural is... My culture says this is right, this is wrong. Your culture says the opposite. But that's fine because you can have your views and I can have mine. And there, there can be disagreement. So why don't you guys talk about it and see what you think. Um, let's see, how many we got? One, two. Do you remember your groups from Monday? Right. Yeah, kind of, can we split into those groups that we had uh, Monday? Um, you guys can just find a group. We're just going to have like, we're going to have to stay. And we'll have to do it for like five minutes and um, then we'll go around the room and see what you guys think. So go ahead and meet up with your groups and we will um, take five minutes to discuss this.
every single child is traceable about that bias yeah. and some sort of dystopian nightmare. Not really dystopian, but like. Well, I don't know why you think it's really interesting how these have a person in way to approach that. I always think of the voice of that teacher from uh, from BBC Whitehead. Yeah. What do you do if they got a child? And the child is a blood transfusion. Yeah. 
Yeah, like they're witnessing you they're like, I don't want my child to have what do you do? Yeah. As a nurse break. So we're, we're, we'll be talking about those, which are really interesting cases. Yeah. <laughs> all right, we'll go around the room and discuss what you guys um, think, think about all this good stuff. All right, so uh, this group, right, this amorphous group, right, right. Oh, uh, is this, are you guys all? I like to sound awkward. <laughs> you ever seen Superman? Have you ever seen the movie Superman? Superman? You've never seen it? Okay, I won't talk all over it. In terms of money, Mark, I think I've seen it. Have you seen it? Remember the, remember the robbery at the grocery store? And the cops are like, uh, you are like, uh, you so it's an African Jew wearing a hoodie. Remember that? You remember so long. You're a shame. Anyway, so this super group right here. <laughs> All right, what do you guys think about uh, moral, uh, ethical relativism, particularly whether it be subjective or cultural? Do you think that that is true? Do you think that we can make moral judgments against people? Or do you think that we have to allow them the space right, to embrace whatever values they have, and we have no right to, I mean, not, not saying we have, we're going to go in and to take over, take them over, or something like that. We have no right to evaluate Criticize. I don't think we should criticize. Yeah. Okay. But what, what I'm saying is, like, if let's say a culture is doing something that you find wrong in your in your culture or whatever, do you think that there is an objective standard of values that you can appeal to to evaluate and to criticize um, those practices that all people should, you know, you know, like all, you know, like. Constitution says all, of course they say men, so that was kind of patriarchal, but you know what I mean? It's supposed to be all humans. Are, and of course they say created equal, but we're all equal in terms of being humans because we're, we're all part of the human race. But um, do you think that there are objective standards that all people, all humans, should abide by, or do you think that it, it should be based on like cultural or you know, subjective, personal? Because some cultures are like, well, we just don't want to do that. And that, that's fine. Mm -hmm. So, like, um, what do you, you, you guys agree? I think it would be creatory. What's that? I think it would be creatory. Oh, no, 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 I agree. And in fact, um, I, I love cultural diversity yeah. because I hate going, <laughs> I hate going to a city where, like, if you know, if you guys been traveling where you drive and you go to, like, one city and, uh, they have two downtowns. They have one downtown that's right off the exit. I think it looks the freaking same as Florence. It's all the same. Then you go to the real downtown, which have all the cool buildings and the cool. That's what I want to see. I want to see stuff that's specific to that, to that culture, to that area. Right. I don't want to see freaking Florence. I don't want to see. You know, what I mean, I want to see something unique. Right. And um, that's I, that's true. I think cultural diversity is amazing. It's great because I like if if I go to Europe. If I go to Asia, I don't want to see McDonald's. Um, I want to see, you know, the, the local cuisine, man. You know, I don't want to eat a, a Big Mac, although, you know, Donald, McDonald's is too good. But, uh, yeah, so cultural diversity is important. So, but you would say, you would extend that to ethics, too, right? Okay, what were you guys saying? Um, you like McDonald's and you were, you yeah, like work at McDonald's. What's that? I actually work at McDonald's with my mom. Oh, do you? I love McDonald's. I even have a McDonald's app. I don't have one. I think I have a McDonald's app. I love. It. I like. Actually, I like the new uh, jalapeno burger. Actually, you know what's funny about McDonald's? I will, I'm gonna. You no, know, listen. I'm gonna walk this back. Actually, even though I said I don't want to go to McDonald's, actually, McDonald's are culturally uh, infused in the movie. Like, for example, you go up to uh, Maine or to Massachusetts. They actually have lobster rolls. You go to, to Texas. I used to live in Texas. You go to South Texas. They have like, well, they have jalapeno burgers now, but they don't have jalapeno. So every region has this unique uh, sandwich, right? To, what? So I work at Chip Boy from Alberta, and just recently did like an They don't do program. that as fast. No, I'm just kidding. Yeah. Go ahead, go ahead. Yeah. But we had an exchange program where we got like six students from Lithuania that came over. Some from Romania, some from Lithuania, some from Ukraine, um, and a few other countries over there. Yeah. And they were all so excited to try American McDonald's. And they were all so extraordinarily disappointed because they're like, this sucks compared to what we have over in Ukraine. Yeah. And I'm like, well, what's the difference about it? And so they start like going on and on about all the different things that they have on their McDonald's menu. And they're like, yours sucks. And I'm like, I'm aware. They probably have like a big Mac stroganoff 
Yes, we have big Max program. You have this crap. What is this? You know, they talk, you know what I mean? So that, yeah, exactly. So I mean, America. I mean, American cuisine would be um, like donut hamburgers and hot dogs. I don't. I don't know. We have some unique food here. Uh, but yeah, I. If, if I go to Lithuania, I want to eat Lithuanian McDonald's. Right? Yeah, it's part of the culture. So it's cool that the McDonald's franchises at least respect that and they can change. It's that's cool. That's cool. So if I go to, uh, you know, if I go to Japan and they have like a teriyaki, it, it'd be yes, you know, with some sake, pretty cool. So do you, what do you guys think? Do you think that um, that cultural and subjective relativism is true? Would you say that every person or every culture and the cultural values that they have should be sort of maintained and and be held as true? Or do you think that there's an objective set of standards? that can uh, at least critique some of those cultural practices. What do you think? Do you agree or do you think that every culture is kind of, should be sort of, well, every cultural set of values should be um, respected? Or do you think that, that there's an overarching set of objective standards that apply to every, to every culture? Mm -hmm. no. Yeah, because it develops independently, right? So, since it, okay. So, what do you guys think, though? You kind of disagree, right? You think that you can critique um, uh, uh, cultural standards, right? So, you guys are like Great Britain and France. You're like, I don't like the way they're acting. No, I'm just kidding. Yeah, I'm not saying that. No, but um, so you, you do think that there are a set of standards that overarch other cultures, and even though there are unique differences that are great and should be embraced. There might be some practices that uh, should be reunited. What do you think? Do you agree? Yeah. Okay, I'm not putting words in my head. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not making no, mistakes. But uh, yeah, so it's a really, <clears throat> it's a really difficult thing to say whether cultural uh, real relativism is uh, is plausible or not. Um, here, let's look at some possibilities. Okay. So if people's moral standards differ from various cultures, then moral norms are relative to culture. Moral standards do differ from various cultures, therefore moral norms are relative to culture. And then of course I ask, is this sound? Um, so premise two is true, but premise one is not. It does not follow that there is not an objective standard of morality since cultures have different uh, moral standards. Um, so let's see what I said. Say premise two is true, but premise one is not. Uh, if people's moral standards differ from various cultures, then moral norms are relative to uh, culture. Ba basically, the point is, is that there are, even though we have different cultural standards, there are some standards that are universal to all people. Right? And again, going back to some of the basics, right, which would be uh, you know, not murdering people, not stealing people. They, those doesn't matter what culture you live in, those are going to be standard overall. Now, obviously, there are different standards in terms of um, certain sets of behaviors that might be related to some religious or cultural practices. And those are, like I said, those are more niche. But the general ones, like, you should not lie to people, right? You shouldn't, you shouldn't be deceptive to people. I mean, that's why every culture, they have, you, you'll see universal crimes, like, you know, the, the the, the way that those crimes are punished obviously differ, but everyone agrees that stealing is wrong. I, I don't think I've ever seen a culture where they, they say, yeah, stealing, let's do it. Or, yeah, murder people just randomly. Or, uh, yeah, you should set up this, um, uh, you know, this table and, and, and defraud people, right? These are things that are universal. Doesn't, I've not, never seen a culture, and if we were to meet aliens, it's like, you know, extraterrestrials, which there's mighty some evidence that they do exist, evidently, if you guys have been watching I don't know, we'll see. But anyways, they probably have those same standards too. Um, I think it's kind of universal that there are certain things you just don't do, right? There's some things you don't do um, that are universal to all uh, cultures. Do you guys agree or no? Do you, do you guys know any cultures where murder is okay or stealing? No. I want to start one now. Let's start a country where we can murder and steal. <laughs> I'd be yes, raw. No. Um, That'd be, that'd be funny. Okay, so another problem with ethical relativism. Uh, 
about. It cannot or has trouble explaining the moral status of social reformers. So that's another problem. Because social reformers, and uh, here's some examples, like Martin Luther King Jr. saw equality in the culture, was against it. Then by standards, is Dr. Martin Luther King appealing if all cultures or morals as relative? So Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. saw something wrong with the culture in the United States. And he was like, you are treating certain people wrong because of the color of their skin. Now that was the culture. That was culture. You had, you had, you had people separated by, by race. <laughs> but Martin Luther King Jr. challenged that within the culture. So if it's the case that you, know, you should respect certain cultures and there aren't any objective moral standards um, you know, that cannot, lines cannot be crossed, then people like Martin Luther King Jr. or Gandhi, uh, Gandhi was, uh, had the same problem in India. Uh, so if that's the case, then those so social reformers really didn't have a foundation to, uh, to base their claims from, but they did. And they were right, and they won, and they, they won in the end, you know, because they were appealing to a general sort of uh, foundation. Obviously, this is not to say that we cannot learn from relativism, or whether it's purely wrong, but it certainly has its problems. So basically, what that, that statement right there is saying is there are moral standards that are relative. And again, those are the niche ones. Those are the ones like, yeah, that's fine. If this culture wants to say that uh, there are certain behaviors that are viewed as being wrong, that's fine, as long as it doesn't, uh, you know, kind of go against the general, the general universal objective moral standards that all people should abide by, right? As long as you're not oppressing people, as long as you're allowing people to actualize, as I like what Aldo Sutton says, as long as people are allowed to actualize their potentialities, and you're not, you know, holding people back. As long, which, I mean, every culture has a problem with that, right? I mean, there are, we're being held back in this country, right? By certain uh, systems and structures. So, <laughs> you know, we, have, we still have a lot of work to go. Uh, you know, we have a lot, a lot to go and a lot of work to, uh, to be done still. But the point is, is we're working towards that by trying to make things better. Ethics and religion. This is fun. Anybody see a connection between ethics and uh, religion? Yeah, have you ever heard the, th the term, uh, this is an old term, you guys, this is well before your time, but back in the day they said there's two things you never talk about, ethics and politics, or religion and politics. You can't ever talk about those two things because you would piss people off. Nowadays it's, nobody cares. It's, like, I mean, it's kind of like, um, like when I was teaching elementary school, like kids would complain, like, oh man, I'm so upset, you know, about this. And, you know, I, I hope nobody notices my point. I'm, have you ever seen Jurassic Park? Remember that part where they're like, Dotson, Dotson, we got Dotson here. See, nobody cares. Remember that part at the beginning? I always do that to kids and get so pissed off. Like, hey, 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 look, look, he doesn't have a, an ice cream cone. He doesn't, see, nobody cares. <laughs> they get so mad, dude. I love, I love trolling kids, it's funny. But anyways, um, I'm a terrible teacher, terrible, <laughs> I'm a mean, no. No, uh, I'd, get them to, I'd get them to laugh so they forget about their problem. You know, that's what you do with kids. You, Make them laugh so that they forget why they were upset in the first place. All right, so historically, religion has had moral content. What that means is that historically, religion has usually been the uh, source for ethical, moral standards. So, uh, going back to the ancients, we go back to ancient Greece, ancient Egypt, all of the ancient cultures um, derive their ethical or moral um, systems on some sort of religious practice. Now typically, whether the religious practices were being mapped onto an already existing substrate of, of ethical uh, practices or the other way around, you know, who knows. The point is, is they were connected at some point. Uh, so religion certainly informed uh, moral, uh, moral uh, norms, moral content. Does that make sense? Yeah. It's kind of changing now. Here, let me put I've got the slideshow here. All right, but, uh, but most religious people derive their mor morality from non-theistic systems of morality and ethics. <clears throat> so what that means is like the golden rule, right? You know, uh, do unto others as you have them do unto you, right? Which is, uh, you know, you find that like in every, I, I think, I think C.S. Lewis, he's a Christian apologist, but he found that in every religion. There are certain golden rules that every religion, right? So um, 
if you look at like, like science, for example, science is a technique of understanding the world that is multi-realizable. What that means is if you're studying something and I'm studying something over here, we're not talking, and we find the same thing, there's probably a good chance that that thing is true, right? Because we found it independently. I wasn't talking to you and trying to guide your, your opinion, right? You found it independently. Well, that's the same with culture. They find these things out independently. Right, so each culture finds out these ethical truths, and they find it independently. They're not talking to each other. They're not like, hey, don't you think it's wrong that people shouldn't steal? Yeah, I don't think you should. You know, they're not talking to each other. These are, these are found out independently. So a lot of religious people would derive their morality from these non-theistic systems. In other words, they would observe how people were behaving, and they would see that they would have this impulse that they just shouldn't do it. Right? This kind of, you know. Now, whether that comes from God or whether that comes from you know, some sort of inner conscience that um, has to do with our neurological evolution or something that, you know, that's obviously a matter of debate. <laughs> we could have that discussion. It's really interesting stuff. But, but for the most part, the point is, is that they kind of work hand in hand or had in the past. And uh, religious uh, systems would often shape and mold uh, these moral norms, but the moral norms already were in existence. Now, where they came from, that's another question. They could have come from God, or they could have come from just our evolution, or could have come from, I don't know, uh, aliens, who knows. But they, they have some source, right? They have some source. Now, actually, I was talking to some guy yesterday. He was talking about how, man, he was a really brilliant guy. He was talking about how, like, the uh, ancient uh, Egyptians had, like, these elongated heads. Like, or, like, the, the I'm sorry, the, the, the pharaohs. And he, he theorized that they were actually aliens. And that he was theorizing that every ancient and even modern um, empire, the, the founders of those empires, the leaders of those empires were actually aliens. But uh, I don't know. <laughs> it's funny. Though. But anyways, um, I don't know why I started talking about that. Anyways, uh, maybe, yeah, I was just saying maybe they come from aliens. I don't know. I'm not saying they do. I'm just, you know, just fun to play with. Okay, so a divine command theory. So we talked a little bit about, did we, did we talk a little bit about deontology, Kantian ethics and all that Monday, right? Okay, so Kantian ethics, just do a little look, uh, recap. Okay, Kantian ethics, Kant was, uh, his name is Immanuel Kant, he was an 18th, 19th century philosopher. He believed that, um, that morals came from a place that you can't observe things. It's outside of observation. That's why he calls it, he's from deontology, you just can't observe it, you just feel it. It comes from where? From the noumenal, we call it. <laughs> and basically, it's a framework of understanding the world. It's a foundation. It's a condition for the possibility of how things should be. So he felt that you had to develop a set of rules or maxims that you would fit your moral uh, obligations into. Like, don't ever steal. Don't ever, you know, all these certain rules. They're very rule-based. But the one main rule was that you had to treat other people as an end in and of themselves. So I couldn't use somebody like I couldn't uh, use you to get some, you know, to get something out of you or to do something for me. I'd have to treat you as someone who I'm engaging with you, not to get something out of you, but because you're like me, you're a rational agent, and you make your own decisions, and I have to respect that. You have to respect me, right? The, so he felt that, for example, you couldn't lie. That was like a no-no ever. It didn't matter what, what the consequences were either. Now, can you guys think of a situation where the consequence of lying? Uh, would actually be good where you probably should lock. On your, what, yeah, give me an example. I mean, we technically have a category of them just called white lies, where we just normally lie to either. Oh, like, oh, that's, you look great that suit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's basically. <laughs> you don't want to like, somebody off. We yeah. have a whole category of lying where we just do teeny tiny lies to, yeah. like, make ourselves seem nicer or not humiliate someone. Yeah, I mean, and that goes with the, well, I was talking about doing the right thing for the right, or the right, right way, right? Doing it the right way. So in some, some ways you don't want to do it that's going to embarrass somebody. That's, that's a good point. Now, the even more kind of catastrophic way that sometimes you might have to lie, for example, let's say you're in Nazi Germany and you're hiding Jews in your attic and the Gestapo comes up, do you have Jews there? And you're like, uh, no. I mean, according to Kant, you'd have to tell them that. Now, Kant would see that action as you being ethical because the, un the, the, the fact that those people would get killed 
letting a shop open, is out of your hands. That's, that's their decision. So he would put the, uh, the obligation of them being hurt on the heads of it. And it's true, but I think most of us would see that as not a really good, you know, <laughs> not really. And then the other one is utilitarianism, which was started by John Stuart Mill, and uh, that's basically achieving happiness. Whatever makes people happy, right? But the problem with that, of course, is how you define happiness. For me, happiness might be laying on a bed of nails for someone else. You know, so happiness is really difficult to define. Um, and another one is virtue ethics, which is Aristotle. Did we talk about virtue ethics at all? Yeah, a little bit. I'll, I'll give you just brief. Virtue ethics is just the embodiment of virtues, like wisdom, bravery, prudence, temperance, all these sorts of things. Of course, the problem with that is how much bravery you should get, how much wisdom you should. Sometimes wisdom can get in the way of being nice to people. Kind of. So virtues are really difficult to determine which virtue you should be embodying at any particular time. So now we have divine command theory. This is another theory uh, we'll briefly go over. And it's real simple. Just uh, right actions are those commanded by God and wrong actions are those forbidden by God. So um, this is really simple. Um, there are, there are um, you know, God basically says this is right and God says this is wrong. Do this, don't do that. Right. So uh, there was this, uh, there was this, uh, dilemma that was brought up in a discussion with a guy named Euthyphro uh, by Plato. It's called Euthyphro's Dilemma. Anyone ever heard of that? Okay, here, Euthyphro's Dilemma was this. Okay, if, was Plato? No, no, we're not. But anyways, uh, Euthyphro's Dilemma was a dilemma where if, and this is from ancient Greece, if um, God command, okay, let's see, if God if God commands something because it's right to do so, then he can't be God because there's a higher power above him, namely goodness, which is imposing its will upon him. So if God does that which is good for the sake of goodness, which is outside of him, then he's appealing to a higher sort of authority. Right? If he's appealing to a higher authority than himself, then he can't be God. Another problem with that is if he wills something, and it's not good, then he can't be God because God has to be pure good. So that's the dilemma. Like it was often said, this this proof that God doesn't exist. Obviously, the, the simple way around that is just to simply say that God is the source of all goodness. Therefore, he's not appealing to anyone else's authority or any higher authority than himself and only himself. But that's what you think for his dilemma, just for your, you know, and you can uh, look at look it up. It's really interesting stuff. All right, so that's the divine command theory. Plato, okay, I discussed uh, Plato's Euthyphro and the problems of divine. Does God do good because it is good, or is it good because God commanded it? Uh, on that hand, we judge God's actions based on a moral standard, which begs the question, is there a higher standard than God's will? Um, on the other hand, is it that God's will is what uh, directs these moral norms we find in nature, and thus scripture lang scriptural language or, or some sort of divine revelation? Use this for teaching or understanding, not for an expression of explicitly uh, God's will. So, I'll, I'll have all these, uh, you know, these notes. And I don't think this is going to be on the quiz, but it's kind of interesting to know. Just for like, if you guys play like, uh, what's that game? Uh, like Trivial Pursuit or something like that. Or trivia. Yeah. If they say, what's Euthyphro's dilemma? And you're like, I know what it is. Does God do good because it's good, or does God do good? Whatever God commands is, uh, is is good. So that's kind of easy for us to know. All right. Anybody have any questions about that? All right. Let's see. All right. Um, let's break it. I'll, I'll, we'll do a real quick one real quick, and then we'll, we'll uh, end the class. But um, stay in your groups real quick. I want you guys to discuss that. What do you guys think of divine command theory? Do you think that that is a good um, basis for ethics? Or do you like some of the other ones? Do you like Kant? Or do you like utilitarianism? Happiness? Or do you like uh, Aristotle's, the virtue, is the embodiment of the virtue? Or do you like divine command, where it's God is the basis for ethics? Now, I want you guys to discuss that for just a couple minutes, and we'll go around and see what you guys think. And then we'll uh, end the class. All right? How's that sound? Or we can sit here and watch a horror movie for a while. We, oh, I'm just kidding.
sort of true for every culture. Now, which which ethical uh, theory do you think would be best? Do you think that we do things to make us happier? Do you think that we do things in order to treat people's own and not ourselves respect people? Do you think that we do the right thing or the wrong thing uh, as a basis of virtues, like trying to uh, sort of express a particular virtue? Or do you think that it's basically uh, that God is uh, the source of what's right and what's wrong, but we're just trying to sort of uh, submit to uh, what you think what you say?
you guys like divine command, and you like divine command, you like virtue. Virtue's getting a lot. What do you guys think? What do you like the best? Virtue. 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 What do you like? Virtue. What do you like? What? Virtue. Man, Kant and utilitarian. No, I get no love, man. You know. <laughs> what, do you, what, do you, what do you like? Part of me likes virtue, but I also like the one where, like, you treat humans as... Oh, Kant. Kind of, yeah, yeah, yeah. You, yeah. I, I couldn't remember the term. Of yeah, Kant. It's deontology or Kantian ethics. Yeah, it's pretty cool. I do like Kant, too. And we'll see how some aspects of Kantian theory is, is effective or very useful in, in some respects, too. So I know I, I, I was presenting in a, an example that was antithetical to his views or kind of contradicted his views. But he's got a lot of good stuff to say. I do not have a huge comment. I mean, like, uh, I go to school, where I go to school, I'm, I study a lot of Kantian and mean Kantian philosophy. So, dude, Kant's cool, man. There's, there's some aspects of that. What do, you, what do you think, what's yours? What's that? Okay, yeah, but well, they kind of go hand in hand. Like I said, um, a lot of early theologians were like Aristotelian virtue ethics. Uh, so they saw divine command and virtue ethics because they felt that God had created the virtues and uh, we mediated or sort of navigated these uh, ethical systems through virtue. So uh, that's cool, man. I love it. It's good stuff.